Welcome everyone to Valley Christian Sunday morning worship service. We want to thank you for joining us this morning. If you will, please turn with me to Psalms 19, starting in verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the ends of the world. You know, God's creation is awesome. And human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation because they bear His image. And here at Valley Christian, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. Our deepest desire is to bring Him glory. And really, the fact that we are imperfect brings Him even more glory because we can't attribute anything good to just ourselves everything that we have, everything that we are, and every good thing we attribute as a gift from God, the perfect Father above. So welcome to our service this morning. Again, I just pray that it could be a blessing to you and to your life, and that uh, from this service that you can grow closer to Jesus. I want to encourage you, if you would like to get in contact with us, because we are having in-person services you can sign up on our website, valleychristians.org. That's valleychristians with an S dot org. And you, if you're tuning in, you already know that you can access our online streaming services. So you can sign up for the in-person services on the app, the VC app, or online at the website. Right now, I'd like to uh, just go through a few announcements. Really, if you're joining us, uh, some of these things will make sense, uh, but we want to invite you to participate in the following things that we're going to be announcing. First of all, the church is broken up into smaller family groups, and every once in a while we will have uh, family groups in action. And this week we have the Mena family group uh, really throwing together an awesome pumpkin carving event. Uh, it just looked like they had a great time. We want to thank the Mena family group. And we know other family groups are also doing some stuff. Send in your videos, send in your pictures so we can spotlight the family groups all over the area doing great things, building family, and expanding and glorifying God's kingdom. So Mena family group want to hold you up. Looks like fun. Um, and I'm not sure who carved that pumpkin, but it probably was someone with a lot of talent. If you have something that your family group is doing that you want highlighted, please send that information to Nadine Stewart. At a midweek service, we announced that Dale and Pam Bowers will be stepping out of the eldership. Dale stepping down from being an elder, and Dale and Pam are stepping out of the spiritual leadership group. I wanted to make sure that the Valley Christian family knew about this. Please keep them in prayer. We just want to thank them for their years of service here at the church. But because of Dale's health, we felt like he felt and we agreed that it was time for them to take a step back and uh, really take stock and to make sure that they're really protecting his health. Um, so Dale, Pam, we love you. We thank you. And we just know that God will continue to use you to build up his kingdom, to build up his family here in Las Vegas and around the world. So thank you again for your service. Now I want to just make sure that all the women in the Valley Christian family know that on October 20th, Nadine will be hosting a all-women's midweek service. So Use the same link that we've been using for our normal midweeks for this Tuesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Now, if you don't have that link, please contact your family group leader and they should be able to provide that for you. Uh, please continue to sign up for the in-person services using the VC app or the website. Just to let you know, on October 25th, we will be streaming our services only. There will be no in-person service, but there are signups for um, the rest of October and into November. 
And just lastly, last but not least, we want to continue to pray for our brother Paul Cody, who recently joined the Army. He is now able to, he's going to be in a location for just about two to three weeks, and he's able to receive package, care packages and letters. Uh, that information is available under the announcements on our VC app and our website. So please, uh, before you send anything, make sure you get that information because there are some things he cannot receive. We are part of a larger church family that spans the globe. And we are grateful that there are many things going on around the church family. One awesome thing is the virtual conference called Stronger. And we want to bring this to the attention of uh, the Valley Christian family, as well as those who are listening. This conference is offered virtually to cover all sorts of different topics from same-sex attraction to uh, addictions to depression and, and all these things, um, parenting, etc. And all the information is, is contained on the slide. Please look it up. Sign up, register. I believe it is uh, $10 before the 18th, and then after that, it's $15. But all the information is on the slide. Also, to go along with uh, the spirit of the fall, we have a virtual pumpkin carving contest uh, that is hosted by Tracy Lee. She could be reached at tracyleevc at outlook.com. Again, all the information is on the slide. Basically, there's no age limit. You just have to submit a picture standing of you standing next to the pumpkin that you carved, not a pumpkin that someone else carved, but a pumpkin that you carved. Submit it to her by October 31st, and then there will be prizes awarded. I want to thank Tracy for putting that on. I know last year, pre-COVID, we had this uh, trunk or treat event that was awesome. But because of COVID and the things going on this year in 2020, we're doing a virtual pumpkin contest. So good luck with all that pumpkin carving. At this point in time, I want to introduce our speaker for today, David Tam. David Tam, he and his wife, Anita, have overseen our children's ministry here at the Valley Christian for uh, a few years. And uh, David is a great brother. Uh, very studious in the Word of God, and he's going to be preaching on Romans chapter 11 this morning, and we are excited about that. And last but not least, we want to welcome Liz Medina into the Valley Christian family, into the family of God, into the kingdom. Uh, she was baptized this past weekend, and we are super grateful for her decision to make Jesus Lord of her life. And in just after I pray, we'll be, be able to see a, a little video uh, showing her baptism. So at this time, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all the things that are going on positive in the Valley Christian family. But we also know, God, that there are a lot of uh, hurting people, God, not just here in the family, but just all around the world. We know that there have been fires and storms and unrest and uh, layoffs and all sorts of things going on. But we know, Father, that you have a plan. We trust your plan. We trust you, Father, that you are going to do what's best for us. Help us to hold on to your hand. Help us to hold on to our faith in you, Lord, and help us to glorify you in all that we do. Bless today's service. Be with Dave. Speak through him in a powerful way. God, we love you. We thank you for all the many blessings. And again, we thank you for Liz and her decision to make you the Lord of her life. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have decided, I have decided to, follow Jesus. to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. Our great.
Hi, good morning. My name is David Tam, and I have the opportunity to share with you the message uh, for this Sunday morning. As many of you know, we are studying out the book of Romans, and Delano came to me a couple of weeks ago and asked if I would like to preach on uh, Romans chapter 11. And, and so that's the chapter that we will be reviewing this morning. But before we can tackle Romans 11, we need to take a quick look back at the previous chapters. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Later on in verse 37, it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I got two things just from these two verses. One, God is working for our good. And secondly, he loves us deeply. And we can be sure that even now, God is working in our lives, in the world, in our country. Now you might ask, how can we be sure? Have you not seen 2020? This year has been a train wreck on so many levels. But what Paul does in the next three chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, is that he uses the story of Israel to show that God is faithful even when his people are faltering, faithless, and frail. And he can use people's rejection of him to still accomplish his wonderful purposes. So just a quick review of chapters 9 and 10. In chapter 9, we learn from Delano that it was about God's faithfulness in light of Israel's rejection. In chapter 10, we saw God's fairness as he now started to allow the Gentiles to be saved. Passages from chapter 10, like everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, are I'm reminded of, and so now Gentiles can be saved as well as the Jews. And as we dive into chapter 11, what we'll see today is that God shows his sovereignty in bringing salvation to both Jews and Gentiles, 
and that God is not finished with his covenant people, the Jewish remnant. So we see God's faithfulness in chapter 9, his fairness in chapter 10, and we'll see today that he is not finished with the Jewish remnant or with us. But before we jump into Romans chapter 11, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that we can come this morning wherever we are viewing uh, this message. And uh, we are so thankful that we can study out the book of Romans, specifically today, chapter 11. Thank you for taking, on, taking us on this journey. God, open up our hearts and our minds now to the wisdom of your scripture. Father, help me uh, to, to say the words you want me to say and, uh, and to bring you glory. Father, we love you. Be with our study this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we'll start by reading Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. It says here, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. So Paul opens up chapter 11 here asking, has God rejected his people? He refers to the story of Elijah, which you can find in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20. If you've read this story before, you'll recall that Elijah had this great victory calling fire down from heaven and destroying the false prophets of Baal. But then Jezebel said to him, I'm going to get you, and may the gods deal with me ever so severely if I do not do to you, Elijah, what you did to my prophets today. The story goes on, and we find Elijah uh, getting fearful for his life. He runs away. Uh, He's depressed and discouraged, and he hides in a cave where God finds him there, the cave of despair. And God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? You know, some of us today are living in this cave. It's a cave called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We see what is going on in the world and in our nation, and we are really fearful. Some of us can't sleep. We're worried all the time. And God is asking the same question to us, that he asked of Elijah, what are you doing here? Don't you know that I'm still in control and I'm working everything out for your good? Elijah says, replies to God's question and says, Israel is carnal and they have given up on you, God. I'm the only one left that serves you. In verse two here, it says that he actually appealed to God against Israel. He appealed to God against his own people. You know, what I find here is that Elijah only saw his present situation and what was going on around him. And he wasn't trusting that God was still working and that God had people that were still faithful to him. He says, I'm the only one that's faithful. Everyone else is against you. Can you relate? I think sometimes we can do the same thing. We might say, well, the disciples at Valley Christian, they're worldly. I alone serve you, God. Or perhaps, well, I'm through with my life group because I'm the only one that fill in the blank. God's response to Elijah was that, Elijah, you think you're so spiritual. You have no clue what I'm doing and you are wrong. I have people that you know nothing about. I have 7,000 faithful Israelites that still worship me, that have not bowed the knee 
to Baal. And he speaks of this Jewish remnant. Here's a practical for us. The next time, like Elijah, you're tempted to pray that God teach someone a lesson, remember that there are things about them you don't know. There are qualities in them that you're just too blind to see. God sees people in an entirely different light than we do. Yes, he's aware of their failings and their frailties and their sin, but he also sees what he's doing and the work which has already taken place in their lives. We miss that. We judge people by what we think they should be. God looks at them and sees what they would have been had he not entered into their lives. And don't forget Philippians 1 verse 6 says, God began a good work in you and he will carry it on to completion. Paul is making the argument that there is a Jewish minority of believers and God has not given up on them and he's not given up on us either. We'll keep reading here in verse 7. It says, What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could, no, could not see, and ears that could not hear. To this very day, and David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Now verse 7 here says that as a people, Israel has not obtained what they were looking for. They were looking for their Messiah and they rejected him. But it says that a few did obtain this, the elect. And what's interesting here is that God calls this Jewish remnant the elect, just as he calls us the elect. It goes on to say that as it is written, God gave some of the Jews over to be hardened. And he gave them eyes in, that could not see and ears that could not hear. You know, sometimes I've learned just from reading the Bible and seeing the different stories that God will harden the hearts of those who, whose hearts want to be hardened. And he will blind those who want to be blind. In verse 9, Paul uh, references, I believe this is coming from uh, a psalm uh, that says, May their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and retribution for them. You know, if you look at the Jewish culture, they have just incredible Jewish traditions. And a lot of it, a lot of those traditions revolve around the table. Uh, beautiful traditions like Shabbat. And uh, Shabbat is uh, observed from a few minutes before sunset uh, every Friday for practicing Jews uh, until the appearance of the three stars in the sky on Saturday night. And it is ushered in by lighting candles and reciting a blessing. And so they have all these uh, beautiful traditions around the table, uh, but God says that the, their traditions have become a snare. And for me, what I got from this is that rituals or traditions or the things that we do, even as Christians, uh, these rituals without relationship with Jesus can become a stumbling block for us. We'll keep reading. Uh, verse 11, it says, Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. So in these verses, uh, we see uh, Paul making the argument that because the Jewish people rejected God, uh, God went to the Gentiles. And he, he goes to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. So I thought that was an interesting uh, passage. 
And he goes on to say, well, why does he do this? Uh, in verse 14, in hope that somehow he may arouse his own people and save some of them. And I kind of think, uh, think of it as uh, just to share from the Tam family. Uh, my son, Evan, as many of you know, he's a very uh, affectionate young boy. And so uh, his mom and I are always loving on him. And we're like, Evan, come over here so we can love on you. Uh, but as he has grown up, he is becoming less affectionate. And so there are times my wife Anita will say, Evan, come over here. We want to love on you. And Evan's not paying attention because he's watching TV or he's on his iPad. Uh, so what we do is we say we know how we can make him envious. So we call my daughter, Michaela. Michaela, come over here. We want to love on you. So Michaela comes over and we start loving on her. And all of a sudden, Evan's ears perk, perk up. And he starts looking around. And then he uh, comes over. And so uh, we are able to make him envious uh, by loving on Michaela. And we do this to grab his attention. And I think God uh, does the same with Israel. In verse 15, it says, For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, then so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? It's a great illustration of an olive tree. And uh, we'll look at a diagram here on the next slide on uh, how we are an offshoot. Uh, we are not the natural branches. As Gentiles, the Bible says here that we are an offshoot. Verse 18 says that we should be grateful and not prideful for our salvation. That we shouldn't boast. Israel lost their place and we were grafted in. But here is a warning to not be arrogant about this. You know, and sometimes, and I have done this personally, I think Christianity tends to look down on the Jews. And we can say, well, they had their chance. They rejected their Messiah. You know, it's, it's our turn now. Uh, but we need to not be boastful or arrogant, but to be grateful for our salvation. In verse 20, it says, again, don't be arrogant, but tremble because we can be cut off again. It reminds me of John 15, when Jesus said, He is the vine and we are the branches. If we abide in Him, we will have life. Uh, but those who do not are pruned. And I think, in my opinion, the most important two passages in all of chapter 11 are verses 21 and 22. And I'll read them again. It says, For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And so as Christians this morning, uh, we, just, we need to consider the kindness and be grateful for God's kindness to us but also the sternness. 
uh, and that he is also a God of justice. I put this uh, little diagram here together to uh, visually represent uh, these uh, past verses that we've looked at. And uh, and you can go back and read uh, these verses, but it talks about, Paul talks about the root. Uh, The root that he is referring to is Abraham. God adopted Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God cultivated them like an olive tree. The olive tree flourishes under the time of Moses, Joshua, and King David. But then, because of unfaithfulness, God prunes the olive tree, which represents the first exile. All of a sudden, wild olive trees spring up around this new olive tree. That would be us, the wild olive trees, the wild things. And because of God's loving kindness, he takes these wild branches and grafts them into the olive tree because of our faith in his son, Jesus. God also gives a warning that we need to abide in Jesus or we can be cut off. So we need to remember to not become conceited and remember that the root is Jewish, started off as, uh, through Abraham, and the root supports us, not the other way around. And finally, that last graphic there to the bottom right is that believing Gentiles are grafted together in with believing Jews. I don't know about you guys, but that's a pretty awesome illustration. Uh, God didn't have to graft these wild olive branches, us. He could have chose to stay just with his covenant people. And so we are so grateful for that. We'll pick it back up here in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 32. It says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. You know, verse 25, it's an interesting passage here. It says that Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant of this mystery. And a mystery uh, in the Bible is something that is uh, is was previously hidden, but now revealed. It's not like a mystery like Nancy Drew or anything like that, but it's a, it's a revealing or an uncovering uh, of something that was previously hidden. And so he says, I'm going to reveal this mystery uh, to you, brothers and sisters, because I don't want you to be uh, ignorant and conceited. Israel has experienced this, this hardening in part. We, we know that some people accepted the Messiah. They are the remnant. And this hardening will continue until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Uh, Another translation has this uh, word as the fullness. The Greek word here is a word, I think I'm saying it right, it's pleroma. And it has this idea of a ship that has been filled up with sailors or soldiers. So at some point, All the soldiers and all of the sailors fill up the ship, and now it is full. And so what I get from this scripture is that there will come a time uh, on this planet when salvation will be complete. And what that means, I believe, is that everyone who will ever be saved will be saved. And then the fullness of the Gentiles will be reached. And at that point, poof, we go up. We don't know when this is and who will be saved. And so the call is to us, uh, Valley Christian, to share our faith with anyone and everyone. And perhaps we might be able to speed this thing up. Verse 26 says that in this way, all Israel will be saved. Another interesting passage. Paul does say that one day, 
uh, Jesus will be acknowledged by his own people. That Jews will begin to accept their Messiah in mass numbers. He doesn't offer any details about how, but Paul simply trusts in God's character and promise that he will not give up on his covenant people. In fact, more and more, today we are seeing God's covenant people, the Jews, becoming believers and accepting Jesus as their Messiah. I was going to actually show a uh, video of some, um, there's a ministry out there called One for Israel, and you can go to YouTube and just Google One for Israel, and it's uh, a ministry that is specifically reaching out, Christians reaching out uh, to Jewish men and women and teaching them about Jesus. And so there's these uh, testimonies uh, that you can see on YouTube. I was actually going to show it today, but because of copyright laws, uh, we're not able to do that. But it's uh, available on YouTube, and you'll see different testimonies of uh, people, uh, Jewish people, and they're sharing their lives and how they began to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus and uh, they'll talk about the traditions of their people, how you have to look a certain way or uh, turn to a certain direction when you pray. There's all these traditions. Uh, There's one man that said his rabbi and his parents told them, don't look into the New Testament. Uh, Jesus was a word you were not allowed to say. Uh, people were worried that you were going to lose your Jewish heritage if you looked into that. Uh, but as some of these men and women did, uh, they were shocked to find that, one, Jesus was Jewish. I thought that was interesting. Um, many of them didn't think that Jesus was Jewish, so they find that out. Uh, they begin to read Matthew, and the first couple of verses is all about uh, the genealogy of Jesus and, and the Jewish people and the Jewish people that they're familiar with. And what's interesting is I watched a couple of these videos and several of them uh, shared that they all came to Isaiah uh, chapter 53, which in the Jewish culture is known as the forbidden chapter. And this is uh, a prophecy of Jesus. And it's the, uh, the chapter that talks about he was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that was meant for us was upon him. And by his stripes, Jesus' wounds, we are healed. And it's interesting that as these men and women read their Jewish Bible and their Jewish prophet Isaiah is speaking of this uh, future coming of Jesus and what he would go through, they're shocked. And on the video, uh, they share, they're like, what is Jesus doing in my Bible. And so Isaiah 53, uh, for, for many of them, is the, the point where uh, they begin to see uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. And they begin to see that the most Jewish thing that they can do is to become a believer. In a lot of these videos, I love, uh, they call Jesus by his uh, Jewish name, Yeshua. And uh, if you watch these videos, you'll it's cool to see how they, uh, they talk about Jesus and they, and they share uh, getting to know him and learning about him. And I'm listening to these stories and I'm on the, the edge of my seat and I'm like, I know him. I, I know who you're talking about. Uh, that's Jesus. And that's my Savior. So if you get a chance, go to YouTube, search One for Israel Ministries and you'll see uh, some of these testimonies. But these people, uh, these Jewish people, is the remnant that Paul is talking about. And so we are truly blessed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We'll keep reading here in verse 30. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. You know, Paul is telling the Christians here in Rome, both Jew and Gentile, he's saying, guys, we're all in the same boat. 
We're all lost. But because God has loved us, he has had mercy on us all. So stop fighting over culture and religion and traditions. Um, and let's acknowledge that we make up the same olive tree, supported by the root, but we are all part of that same olive tree. And it is only by grace that we are saved. As we wind down here, towards the end of uh, chapter 11, Paul begins to move from theology into doxology and just uh, worship and praise. And it says here, in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You know, Paul is so blown away by God's faithfulness and how God used Israel's rebelliousness to graft us Gentiles into the olive tree. Yet God is still able to graft the believing Jews, the natural branches, back in. Verse 34 says, we can't figure out the mind of God and what he is doing. You know, I think sometimes as Christians, we think we know better. And we think we know what God is trying to do in our country, maybe with the upcoming elections. But the truth is, we have no clue. I know me personally, I can latch on to some piece of news article, some fact, some tweet, uh, or some posting that uh, some of my friends will send me, and then I, I begin to run with it. And then I repost it and retweet it. And then I get an army of people that agree with me, and I join that group. And I'm like, yeah, this should happen, or that should happen. And I can get involved, and I'm not a very social media type person, but I can find myself uh, agreeing that this particular party is evil or this candidate needs to win because that's what God wants. And if the Bible says here, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? You know, sometimes I think I know what's best for this country or for this church and his people. But the truth is, I don't know. You know, perhaps 2020 and all the things that are happening, God is allowing so that he can graft more people into the olive tree until the fullness of the Gentiles is reached. Maybe he is allowing all these things to occur so that the Jews will begin to acknowledge Yeshua as their Messiah. But I do know in verse 36, and I've highlighted it here, that for from him and through him and for him are all things. You see, guys, it's not about us and what we want or what we think should happen. It's about God and his glory and his ways. We'll conclude here with a story. A battleship was cruising the Atlantic off the northern coast of Maine. One stormy evening, the commander was notified, Sir, there's a light ahead, oncoming vessel. Signal the oncoming vessel to change his course 10 degrees to the west, ordered the commander. The message was sent. But a light flashed back. Change your course 10 degrees to the east. Signal again. Change your course 10 degrees to the west, ordered the commander. The message was sent again. But a light flashed back. Change your course 10 degrees to the east. Signal again. Change your course 10 degrees to the west. I am an admiral of the United States Navy, barked the commander. The light flashed back. Change your course 10 degrees to the east. I am a sailor, a seaman, third class. By this time, the admiral was incensed and he thundered, Signal again, 
Change your course 10 degrees to the west. I am a battleship. And the seaman third class transmitted the final message which would settle the altercation completely and decisively when he said, change your course 10 degrees to the east. I am a lighthouse. Guys, this morning, God is the lighthouse. He is the light of the world. He is the rock of your salvation, the creator and sustainer of your soul. He is the alpha and the omega, the one who knows the beginning from the end. Trust in him and he will guide you home. Thank you for joining us today. To God be the glory and thank you for viewing. Have a great day. Again, just want to thank David Tam for an awesome message. And now as we go into communion, please turn with me to Luke chapter 4. You know, this communion, if it had to have a title, it would be the beautiful feet of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, it says, How beautiful on the, on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. You know, the thing about Jesus is he was the bearer of incredible news, good news to those who would believe. And there's a part in, his, in the beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 14. 
Let's read it. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And this is after his temptation in the desert. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So Jesus went around from synagogue to synagogue, preaching and teaching and spreading the good news. In verse 16, it says, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. It says, He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You know, this passage of scripture that Jesus read is a passage of scripture that For those looking for the Messiah, those looking for the Savior, those looking for the Anointed One would readily know. And what's amazing is they handed Jesus a scroll and they didn't have book, chapter, verses like we do today. It's not like he went to the the, uh, index and, and, and looked up where he was supposed to read from. If you've ever seen uh, a scroll, it, it is jumbled and, and, and you just have to know where things are at. And Jesus knew exactly where he wanted to go in the book of Isaiah. And the thing that I want us to see in this communion is Jesus is the bearer of incredible news. He's the embodiment of good news. Now, I know depending on how you're living your life, Jesus wasn't, for me, Jesus wasn't always good news. Jesus, uh, depending, you know, how I lived my life before becoming a Christian and and before really having a conviction about sin, Jesus was the bearer of judgment, the bearer of condemnation, the bearer of telling me how, how horrible I was. But when I came to the realization that Man, Jesus has something incredible for my life. Something that is so different than what sin has to offer. Sin offers a moment of pleasure and in some cases a lifetime of regret. But with Jesus, he says that the Spirit of the Lord is on him. The power the the miracles that Jesus did through the power of the Holy Spirit. What's the good news? The Spirit that was on Christ was made available to every believer through Him. John chapter 14 through 16 talks about the the power of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of Jesus' disciples. And that Spirit is made available to us. You know, for me, living the Christian life seemed like an impossibility. Because I thought I had to live it on my own strength. And it wasn't until I studied the scriptures and really looked into what God had to say that I realized that the Spirit is given to those who would follow Jesus so that they would have the power to do it. Not in their own strength, but the power of the Holy Spirit that was made available to us through Jesus Christ. The other good news is to the poor that they're not forgotten by God. Matthew chapter 5 Verse 3 says, it's in the um, Sermon on the Mount, and I don't want to misquote it, so let me just read it. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now you said, I thought he was talking about the materialistically poor. I, I believe that too. I believe Jesus came, and many people he reached out to were the poor and the dejected and the ostracized from society because they weren't, they didn't have wealth. But When Jesus talks about the poor, I believe he's also talking about the poor in spirit, the people who realize how bankrupt they were spiritually. And Jesus offered them good news, that their poverty did not have to separate them from God. You know, we see a lot of poor around us here in Nevada. 
And I'm sure wherever you may be watching this in another state, you've seen your, the poor around you. And there's not often a lot of good news given to them. But Jesus let the poor in spirit, and even the poor materialistically, he let them know that they're not forgotten by God. He talks about setting the prisoners free. And I believe in this case, the prisoners of sin he came to set free. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 7, and verse 18 and 22 talks about being set free from sin. You see, the one thing that about being a prisoner to sin is that powerlessness to overcome the thing that just drags us down, the thing that brings us guilt, the thing that just oppresses us. And Jesus came to set the prisoners free. The blind could finally see the light. John chapter 8, verse 12, and verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 5. Jesus talks about being the light of the world. And Jesus came in a way, and we see through His Word, that, that He came to bring light to a dark world. We look around us right now, there's a lot of darkness. But we go back to what Jesus preached. We go back to His platform. We go back to His stance. And His is a stance of unconditional love. His is a stance of grace. His is a stance of, I want you to be saved from this world of darkness. And it goes on to say the oppressed could experience freedom. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 2 talks about no condemnation, but being at peace with God, being set free from the law of sin and death. And last, the Lord's favor he proclaimed to the world through the coming of Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world. See, when it says that he came to proclaim the Lord's favor, he came to let the world know that they are loved. Not because we have earned it, not because we deserve it, but because of God's grace. As we take communion, let us understand that we do so because of God's grace and his love for us. The bread the body of Jesus broken for us, the fruit of the vine, the blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sin. We didn't earn it. And it is good news because every time we celebrate it, we remember all that God has done and we commemorate it until Jesus returns. It is good news to be able to celebrate communion because it's a sign of what God has done what God is doing, and what God will do in the lives of those who love Him. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we take communion, we do so with grateful hearts. We do so with an understanding of how much You love us and care for us. We do so with just great appreciation for all that Jesus has done. God, as we take the bread and as we take the fruit of the vine, help us to do so, remembering Jesus. We love you. We praise you and help our lives to glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.